How many of y'all have actually ever used Postman? Um, just give me a thumbs up in the chat um, so that I can get an idea as I go through this, just so that, you know, we don't want to make things too advanced or too easy. Got to get the right level in, you know? But that being said, um, for those of y'all who don't know me, um, a little bit of an introduction. So my name is Harsha. I am a computer science and mathematics major here at UT Dallas. Um, on the side, I also work as a software developer at Reveal Brainspace. And for ACM, I'm actually the director of development. So we do a lot of pretty exciting work. We develop a lot of fantastic features. And Postman is something that we actually use all the time um, building our API here at ACM. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we use it, how to use Postman, and get you guys acquainted with this fantastic tool. If you all have any questions um, at any point in time, you can ask in the chat. We have plenty of officer, officers who can chip in and talk about stuff. Cool. So what is on our agenda for today? This is basically what's on our agenda. Um, we're going to do an introduction to APIs and Postman. Um, after that, we're gonna talk a little bit about what is a request, what is a response, things of that nature. And then we're actually gonna go into a live demo. So we're gonna start trying things out. Um, I'm gonna walk you through what it's like to actually use the application and then we'll follow up. Any questions about this? All right, if not, let's get started. So what is an API? Does anyone wanna try answering what this question is before we actually read out the answer? I kinda of wanna see like what y'all think an API is. Um, and I'm gonna give y'all like 15 to 20 seconds to try and answer this question before I sort of dive into a full in-depth explanation. Cool set of data, okay. Let's keep it coming. Come on, I got 30 something people in this chat. So I'd like to hear a couple of different opinions about what y'all think an API is. Anyone else? Something that fetches data, okay. A way for an app to request data from a server. Yep, those are definitely correct. Um, application programming interface. I love the fact that you guys are reading what's on the slides. <laughs> <laughs> and Saksham has, I think, done a little bit of cheating and gone and looked ahead in the slides. <laughs> Interactions between app and the server, absolutely 100% correct. Um, allows two apps to talk to each other, yep. Transfer data from one point to another. You are all absolutely 100% correct about these answers. Um, and, you know, you know, as before I dive into this explanation, one thing that I want to say is a lot of people, you know, think that the concept of an API only has to do with like web APIs or like making API calls and requests, HTTP, things of that nature. But the generic definition of an API is actually so much more simpler. Um, believe it or not, like every one of you here has used an API or has used some sort of application where there is an interface. Um, I'll give you all a really simple example. Let's say you're building a really, really simple like Java application, right? And you create a class, you create a bunch of variables and functions and you wanna use that class. When you wanna use that class, you don't just like copy over the code inside that class again and again and again, right? You call a certain set of functions which define the interface for that class. That's how you make use of that code, right? And Web APIs that we're going to talk about in this workshop sort of work the same way. Um, you build an application, it's running on someone else's computer, it's running on someone else's server, and you want to be able to communicate it, communicate with it. Now, you don't necessarily re-implement all the logic that whatever your third-party service you're using does. What you're going to do is you're going to call basically a set of functions that that API has defined, its interface essentially, and that's how you can interact with it. Does that sort of make sense? The concept of an API by itself is not unique to just websites. It's not unique to just servers. It's not unique to things like that. 
it can be as simple as like two Java classes that you create on your computer that want to talk to each other. And that's really what it is. So over here, um, basically what's on the slide that says is, you know, when you have multiple services, whether that's Google, Twitter, Facebook, um, even a weather API, you don't really need to re-implement the logic that they have. You can basically use their services um, just by calling an API, which just means calling a set of functions that they've defined. So this is the example that Saksham actually was talking about. Um, imagine a digital restaurant, right? Um, so the idea here is you are like the person over here, there's two applications, right? The person is an application and the, the chef is an application. Um, what does the person wanna do? The person wants to eat food. What does the chef do? The chef prepare, prepares the food, right? Um, but in order to be able to request to the chef, like, hey, what do I wanna eat? What do I not wanna eat? Um, you have the waiter that acts as a middleman, um, right? The person by himself may not be able to communicate exactly that this is something that they want. They just look at a menu, right? A menu is basically like a list of things that in this example, a list of things you can order from the chef. But from an API's perspective, a menu would be like the list of API endpoints or the list of functions you can call in an application. So it shows you all the different things you can call, all the different things you can request. And you basically tell that to the waiter. The waiter will take your request to the chef, give it. Chef will do something with it and send back something that the waiter will deliver to you. And APIs essentially work exactly the same way. Any questions about this? And if y'all have any questions, feel free to start dropping them in the chat at any point in time. We've got plenty of people who can help out with them. So we'd love to hear what y'all have to think. That being said, a little bit of fancy animation. So yep, person requests something to the waiter. Waiter carries that same request to the chef. At no point do you directly talk with the chef, right? And in the real world situation, you can imagine that part where I said, you don't talk directly with the chef you don't directly ever talk with the code that's running in your weather API. Let's say you pull up your phone and you pull up like the weather application on your phone. You're not ever talking to whatever is directly running the code there, right? Like we don't know whether the weather app has been written in C++ or Java, Go, JavaScript, whatever you might have. Um, and our application might be written in a different language entirely. But the thing that ties the two together is the concept of an API, like a uniform language that two different applications can use to be able to communicate with each other. And then, yep, the chef sends back a request, sends back a response that the waiter brings back to the person. Let's get a little bit more technical. So that was sort of a pseudo example that we used. Um, in this situation, um, we're talking about how the Instagram application works. So when you use Instagram and you wanna post a photo, um, you're basically going to request the camera API. Instagram basically says, hey, um, I would like to take a photo, um, can I do so? And for that, it uses the camera API. It'll say, can I take a photo? Camera API says, sure, let's it take a photo. Instagram then sends that photo to a server and the server is then basically able to send that out to everyone else in the world. And this is in a sense how APIs work. You'll notice one of these is a web API and the other one is not. Um, the camera situation is basically just calling a function. It's not even a web API, but with the server it is. Any questions about this, either conceptual or not conceptual? How are y'all feeling about the concept of an API so far? Y'all can give me just a thumbs up, you know? Like the thumbs up works as well too. Uh, it's a fast way so that you don't have to type something in the chat. LOL, I don't think means, yes, I understand, but thank you, Samriddhi. <laughs> so there's an API for everything. What, I mean, if you want to co communicate with any service, like there's an API out there that lets you communicate with that service. 
Um, has anyone here used any of the APIs that are on my screen? I think if you've taken uh, CS2 with Professor Khan, he actually makes you use one of these. Anyone ever use them? All right, Google for my hackathon. Okay, okay. Google again, tried Spotify. All right, Eric's using everything out there in the world. Awesome, awesome. Anyone wanna actually turn on their mic and talk about what they use the API for? That might be exciting. A real life example. Oh, I have an example. Um, so one time I used like, uh, I forgot the name of the API, but it was basically to get information about stocks. So whenever like there was a big uh, change uh, in percentage, uh, between like previously and the current day, then um, I, I could use like the tool your API to send me a text message um, after after the drop. So um, I use like the the two APIs um, to to do that. Awesome! Thanks for talking about that. Yeah, Twilio is a great service for sending text messages. So. This over here talks about how, you know, if functions are the building blocks for um, applications, APIs are essentially the building blocks for third party software. So um, that's basically the gist of this. So we go back to what is an API, right? Um, we went through all these different examples and the concept of an API essentially says that it acts as a middleman between your client and your server. Um, for you as an end user, it gives you access to data that's on a third party server or services and a couple of different examples. Now, what essentially is Postman is something we'll get to, but there's a little bit of a teaser here that talks about what Postman does. Postman acts as something that you can use to make API calls really, really, really easily. And we're gonna see how that happens. How many of y'all have used Postman actually? I'm curious. We've heard about how many of y'all have used APIs, but how many of y'all have used Postman? So Postman, it's a collaborative API development platform. Um, I like that many of y'all have used it and one key thing that's important here is the collaborative point. It lets you work really well with other people and that's one of its strongest strengths. It's a way for you to collaborate on testing your APIs, deploying your APIs, creating APIs, things of that nature. How many of y'all have ever made an API call via command line as opposed to like using Postman for making an API call? Okay, one, two. All right, I see some some professional, you know, Unix users here jumping in. Sweet. Um, but one thing you can see is that it's really hard to understand the curl aspect of it. It's pretty much mumbo jumbo for someone who's looking at it the first time. Postman, it's a very very clean interface for being able to work with APIs, and that's one of its biggest strengths. It's wonderful for beginners. It's wonderful pe for people who are even experienced. Everything is so well organized. Um, and that's what we're going to look into today, how to use all the different features that Postman offers. So API calls have two essential parts to them, requests and responses, OK? So. When we looked back at the waiter example, um, we saw that the concept of a request is essentially what you as a person are requesting for the chef. 
like, what do you want to order from the menu, right? And the food is essentially what the chef returns as a response back to the person. So now that you have a general idea of what a request and response is in that kind of a situation, let's look at it in an API example, a little bit more technical here. Three ingredients. We have methods, address or endpoints, and a path. Um, there's actually an example, I think, in a couple of slides from now, but let's imagine, actually, here's, here's a good idea. You all see the event check-in link at the bottom, right? Now, if that was an API, um, does anyone want to tell me like what the address is, what the path is? Does anyone want to try to take a shot at that before I answer? Three. So maybe um, at that acmb2.co is your host host name, and then check in postman is your base path. Yeah, absolutely. You're correct. And yep, you're correct too, Ruthridge. Uh, all the way up to the co is the host name. It's the address or the endpoint. Check in slash postman is the path. And actually, when you navigate straight to a website, everything is pretty much just a get request. So that would be the method as well. But every time you interact with an API, those are the three ingredients you need. Couple of different HTTP methods. So there's four of them. Get, post, put, delete. Actually, there's more than four. There's like 20, 25, 30. There's like hundreds of them, frankly. And you'll see once you go to Postman, you can like pick between different ones. But these are the four that are most commonly used. Patch is also used quite frequently. Um, instead of put sometimes, they're almost interchangeable. But these are essentially, it's metadata for an API. When you say that your method is a get request, um, you're basically retrieving information. When it's a post request, you're sending information, put, you're updating, delete, you're deleting information. Um, it's kind of like how when you build a class in Java, you would have getters and setters. It's sort of the same concept. You have API endpoints that do get functions. You have API endpoints that post data, that put, delete, and so on and so forth. Um, the API we're going to interact with in a little bit when we get to the actual demo that's hands-on, you're going to see that we're going to do all four of these commands. So you'll get a chance to actually try that out yourself. So it'll be super, super fun when we get there. Yeah, um, so here we're talking about endpoints and paths. So Saksham talked about this a little bit earlier with our example down there, but the idea here is the endpoint itself is the host URL, the, uh, the path is what shows up at the very end. You can have a couple more things actually. Um, if you dissect a full URL, sometimes you'll have query parameters. Have you all ever seen a URL where there's like a question mark at the end and then there's like, a random bunch of letters and strings that go through. Yeah, so those are essentially query parameters um, where you're accessing the same endpoint and the same path, but you're basically filtering data. And Ruthvid, yeah, you're absolutely correct, Google search. Like when you do google.com slash search question mark, and then whatever your search query is, um, that's how you're searching for things. You're accessing the same endpoint, right? Like when you go to google.com slash search, what are you essentially doing? You're trying to search, but what you might be searching for and what someone else might be searching for could be two entirely different things. And that's why you have the concept of query parameters. But for an API um, concept is the same thing. You have a host name where, wherever your API is deployed and then you have a path. Oh, also by the way, one thing that I should mention um, as y'all are paying attention is if you stay till the very end, um, there is a challenge that Postman has provided, which if you complete, you get entered to win some very, very fancy Postman swag. So something to just keep in the corner of your mind. Uh, it's at the very end of our slide deck. I'll tell you what the challenge is. Aha, uh -huh. this is where I was talking about the query parameters. So sometimes you want to call the same API endpoint but you want to pass in different pieces of data. Um, and you can do this in the query. So there's query parameters. Authorization is also something else that you can provide to an API call. Um, the idea with authorization is 
basically, sometimes you want to access an endpoint and maybe you're not allowed to access it. Or maybe you want to change some information, but you only want to change your own information, right? So at that point, you can basically authorize your request. You can say, hey, I'm going to include an API key as part of my API call. Maybe you're going to include a client secret and client ID. Maybe you're going to include username and password or a JWT. There's a lot of different ways to go about it. And finally, headers in body. Body is like a big chunk of text or a JSON that you can pass in to an API call. Like for example, let's say you go to Facebook and you make a new account, you would pass in a huge body that contains like your entire profile. <clears throat> like when you fill out that form, that's like your first name, your last name, date, things like that. Um, all of that gets passed in the body. And actually the same thing happens at app.acmutd.co as well. If you go ahead and create a profile on our website, um, that all that data essentially gets passed in the body of an API call um, to ACM's core API. Coolio. And kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, if y'all have questions about any of this, if you feel like I'm not going into enough detail, feel free to ask. I can always elaborate more. So you have made a request. You have told Facebook you want to create a new account. You have told Twitter you want to make a tweet. You have gone to Google and you've made a search. What happens next? You get a response back. You get a response back from Google or Facebook or Twitter or whatever third party service you're using. And there's a couple of key aspects um, to the receiving responses part. The first one is a status code. The status code is a fast way to know like exactly what happened. Um, so a 200, you guys might be familiar with this, just means, okay, everything went well. A 404 is probably the most popular status code in the history of ever, means not found. Um, there's a couple of others. There's 300s, there's 400s, 500s. Let's do a little bit of a challenge actually. Um, if you all know what some of the status codes mean, does anyone know what a 401 means? It's quite common once you start using APIs. A 401. All right, Sam, you're opening up a retirement account, I see. Correct, yeah, unauthorized. If you ever make an API call and you get a 401 back, it just means you're not authorized to make that API call. Um, yeah, it's a good one. Let's do, let's do another one. For example, what about, what about 300s? Does anyone know what, if you get a status code in any of the 300s, what does that typically mean? It's a little bit more challenging, I know. Redirects, yeah, absolutely. So let's say you try to access an API endpoint, or you try to access a website and it's been moved or shifted or it's gone somewhere else and you get redirected, you will get a 300. Let's do one last one, okay? Um, and I promise it's not gonna be as hard as the 300s. What about a 500? What kind of a situation would result in a 500 status code? Server error, yeah, okay, I see I see it flooding in the chat. Okay, everyone, I think everyone has broken an API at some point then. Yeah, if you ever break an API or you know you do something absolutely terrible, actually not you do, but the API itself does something terrible and crashes and explodes, you will get a 500 back. But cool, I, I love to see that y'all are uh, aware about this. And don't worry if you if you guys feel like, oh my God, how does he have all of this memorized? Like it's just, it happens when you've been working with APIs for a long time. And I promise like in a couple of years, the same way you know that a 404 means not found, you will know what all of these other status codes mean as well. And kind of like the same request, you can also have headers and body data with the response as well. So let's say you make, uh, let's say you log into Facebook for the first time and it loads up your profile. Um, that's like the body, that's like your profile being passed in the body data back to you. Live demo time, who's ready? Um, if you guys looked at the pre-document, um, there was information on there about 
how to get started with Postman. You guys would have been prompted to like go to their website and make an account. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and make a couple of API calls, okay? So I'll guide you through them. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and if you have questions at any point in time, feel free to ask. We'll go as quickly or as slowly as necessary to ensure that everyone knows how to work with APIs. A little bit of background about the API we're gonna work with. Um, we're gonna work with a joke API. It's really simple. So there's a server out there that someone else made, not me. I was tempted to actually use our own API for this example, but we're gonna go with someone else's because it's super, super funny. Um, so there's an API. And basically what this API does is if you call it, it returns a joke to you um, and it returns CS jokes, which are really, really funny. Oh my God, Kendall, that is that is hilarious. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go ahead and try that out. And we're gonna go through those four different methods that we saw earlier. So we're gonna get a joke, we're gonna make our own joke, we're gonna update a joke, and we're gonna delete a joke, okay? Which sounds really sad, like, do we really wanna delete a joke? But you know, you can always make it again afterwards, right? So that's what we're gonna do. The link to actually go ahead and see the see the template for making an API call is over here. Um, if y'all go there, it's gonna prompt you to basically fork an API workspace. And if you already have a Postman account, like this should take no more than three seconds. You just click on the link and you're done. But can y'all let me know once you have completed this and I will go ahead and actually get started with the demo. And I posted the link in the chat as well. If y'all find it easier to just click. Now I'm gonna wait till about 7.31 before I actually get started with the demo, I would like as many people as possible to try and follow along. Um, by the way, this is part of the challenge. Like once you go here, it's gonna guide you through doing a couple of things. And once you do it, you're supposed to submit that. So if you wanna win awesome Postman swag, like awesome, awesome, awesome Postman swag, I highly, highly recommend you actually go through and follow along with this. It's really fun. Um, it's quite simple. And if y'all are looking at it after you have forked it over, um, there's just there's just gonna be a single request in there, just uh, one get request. So that's what you should expect to see. Awesome, thank you, Rashmi. Awesome, awesome. You know, this is one of the uh, really cool parts with Postman is, um, Individual workspaces, you can treat them almost like GitHub repositories. Like you have a folder, you have requests inside of a folder, um, and those requests are sort of analogous to files. And once you finish making it and you upload it to Postman, you can you can literally share it with other people, uh, much like you would share a GitHub repo. And they can fork your repo. They can open a pull request back to your repo after editing requests. Like. The, the collaboration aspect of it is identical to Git. Like it's so wonderful to work with. All right, I'm also gonna swoop over uh, give me a second while I stop screen sharing and reshare.
Okay, you guys should be able to see um, my Postman workspace over here, okay? If anyone can't see it, um, just let me know. And what you guys should be seeing is also basically the same thing. And now I know it kind of looks really, really crazy on here. There's like a hundred different links. There's so many different things you can click on, but don't be scared. We're gonna interact with like at most three buttons. And that that is about it, okay? We're, we're gonna deal with just the very, very basics over here. So what you should see is on the left, you'll have a collection called basics of API, okay? Um, a collection is equivalent to a repository. It's sort of like a folder that contains all of your stuff. So you'll have a basics of API folder that contains all of your requests. Inside of it, you'll have just a single uh, request called a get joke. And that is basically the API call, okay? And right now there's only one provided as a template. We're gonna go ahead and make several more in the process. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with this. Um, what I want you all to do is when you go to get joke, um, you'll see that if you click on get joke, actually, before I dive into explaining uh, the API call we're going to make, let me point to you guys at, a, at what you're looking at, okay? This place over here that says URL, or I think it says fill in URL for you guys, something along those lines, that's where you're going to type in the endpoint and the path for the website where we want to make a call. So let's say you wanted to interact with facebook.com or Google or Twitter, anything out there. Like this is where you would type in the link. You can actually do it pretty easily. You can just do google.com and hit send. Okay, if y'all ever see this happen, just refresh the page. I think I had my uh, Postman cloud agent active for way too long. Ta-da. So once you type in your your request essentially, you can go ahead and just click send and don't worry about anything else that's on the page. Like ignore all of these other tabs, buttons, links, whatever it might be. Like all you care about um, first time users is the very, the link itself and just this big send button over here. Okay. Now, one thing that's actually useful to remember, um, I think it's not talked about very often is, but when you go to any website um, you're always making a get request. Like when you when you land on a website and you know you're you're just trying to interact with it, that's a get request happening right there. And you might be thinking, like, okay, I'm making a get request, but like what is my response, right? So when I when I go to google.com, my my get request is that this is the URL that I'm going to, right? Um, but what is my response? Does anyone know what the response is when I go to google.com? Hint, it's actually like down here, but what exactly is this? HTML, correct. But the HTML for what exactly? Yeah, the content of the site, you're absolutely right. Yeah, the landing page. like. This HTML, if I was to just copy this HTML into a file and like open it up, I would see google.com, the landing page. And you can do this with like literally any other website. Um, we can try it with something like what? Facebook.com. Ta-da, you get more HTML. What is this HTML for? This is the landing page for Facebook. Um, what we're doing here is we're mimicking the action of actually like opening a new tab and typing in google.com and going to that website. Um, Sai, if you're getting a cores error, one thing you can do to resolve it. Um, yeah, try, you're absolutely right. When you do inspect element, you should see the exact same thing, like ditto one-to-one. 
Um, and for if you get a course error, um, one thing I can recommend is open it up on the desktop client, like Postman. Like I'm on the website for Postman right now, but you can also like just get the Postman app itself. Like it's an application you can download. It will run a lot faster if you have it locally. Um, I just have the web version up because I think most of y'all also have it up and I wanna make sure that we're seeing the same thing. Um, and I can actually talk about that course error at the very end, Sai, if you wanna bring that up as a question because when working with APIs, a lot of people are going to come across that error pretty frequently. It's fairly common. Alrighty, so back to Postman, what do we see? We see that we have made a GET request to this website. We sent it, we got back a response. The response was the HTML for that website and that entire HTML is down here. Um, one of the cool things with the uh, Postman itself is there's a bunch of different viewers here. Like there's a pretty viewer, there's a raw viewer, preview, things like that. And this is super cool. So let's take a look at this, right? The pretty viewer is what you see when you do inspect element. It's the HTML for the page, but you're seeing it as text. If you click on raw, you're once again going to see HTML, but what, what essentially has happened is it's been, it's basically turned into like one big string that you're looking at. Um, and if you were to make a real API call, like you would get back a string. And one of the nice things with Postman is that it turns the string into something that's pretty to view. You know, it's formatted, it's got indentations, things of that nature. But we all know about HTML. HTML is used for websites. And when you go to facebook.com, um, you're not looking at this text. You're not looking at this raw HTML or even the pretty HTML. You're looking at like the GUI for the website, right? And that's what this preview pane lets you do. So look, it's basically parsed the HTML and it's showing you what the website looks like, which if you ask me, this is fantastic. Like there's no other tool out there that lets you interact with it in this manner. It's absolutely awesome. You can do this for any website, by the way. I recommend like you guys actually try it out for a couple of different websites, just play around with it, see how it works. Um, Postman is fantastic in what it can do. There is also a visualize panel here. If you click on it, it's gonna say, can't visualize your response. Um, the visualize panel is quite interesting. It's applicable when you're getting back some sort of numeric or metric data that you can visualize. So let's say you're trying to access some sort of chart API, some sort of diagram API. Um, maybe you're working with like Elasticsearch or something of that sort. And when you get your data back, you can turn that into like a beautiful chart right here in Postman. Um, it's phenomenal. <clears throat> Any questions about these things so far? We've only talked about the URL, this big send button and the actual response we get back. One, two, three things. Any questions about these three? Because if not, we will talk about the fourth thing on the page, which is this get method part over here. <clears throat> okay, going once, twice, thrice, if no questions, let's talk about that. So what I want you guys to do is if you click on this collection where it says basics of API Postman workshop stuff, um, you'll see a documentation bit open up on the right side. If it doesn't open up, like there's, there's a button on the right side called documentation um, you can click on it and it'll open up this window. Um, this basically describes what we're going to be doing as part of this live demo. Um, so there's an endpoint over here. Go ahead and copy that endpoint because um, this is the API for the joke application. So someone wrote a joke application. It's running on a Heroku server somewhere out there in the far distance. Um, we're gonna go ahead and call that API. We're gonna see what happens, okay? So once you've copied it, go back to your get request, paste it. And one thing to keep in mind is there is a slash at the very end of that URL. Just make sure to remove it before you call the API and then go ahead and click send. And you should get back a response that says this. Hey there, this is a simple demo for making an API server. 
Can I get a couple of people to say, yes, I'm good. I've completed this. Tra, great question. Why did we have to remove the slash? Um, think about it um, from a folders sort of perspective. When you put a slash, you're no longer referring to just the endpoint. Um, okay, for some people, actually, if you put the slash, it might not work. Um, but when you when you put the slash in there, you're essentially referring to the folder and not the actual endpoint itself. But yep, that's the difference. It's uh, I mean, think about it this way. Let's say that um, you had you had an API folder inside of the API folder. You had a source folder, and inside of the source folder, you had a test folder. If you do API slash source, you'd be referring to that source file or that source folder. But if you do API slash source slash, you're referring to that directory at that point. It's just a very minute difference. Cool. So if everyone is able to see the joke, that is fantastic. Well, this is not actually a joke. I hope none of you actually thought that this is a joke, what the response was being sent over here. OK. <laughs> Um, in order to get a joke, what we're going to do is we're going to go to slash. Yes, you do need to fork, Eduardo. That is correct. Um, if you go back to the link I shared, um, it should immediately prompt you to fork the entire workspace. Go ahead and like fork it, and then you will be able to send. So the reason it isn't actually able to let you send directly is because when you open up the link right away, it's not you're not looking at your own requests. You're looking at Postman's requests. OK, let's go back to getting a joke, actually. So this isn't a joke. I hope no one thought this was a joke. To get a joke, you do slash joke, and then you do send. Ta-da, we see a really, really funny joke. I hope y'all think this is funny. What is a programmer? A programmer is a machine who turns coffee into code. Um, so go ahead and y'all also try this. I hope you guys see your jokes pop up. <laughs> yes, everyone will get different jokes. Um, there is a randomizer um, that gets a couple of different jokes out there. So if I call the endpoint and what you call the endpoint, um, it doesn't get the same one. Okay, thank you guys for sharing <laughs> your jokes. I love it. Um, can several more of y'all share the jokes you got, um, even if it's the same one? Yep, sending it again gives you another joke. There is a randomizer, the coffee one. Coder CEO built the company headquarters by calling the constructor. Yeah. What is hardware? The part of the computer which you can kick. Fantastic, fantastic. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make our own joke, OK? This is going to be fantastic. How many people do we have on this workshop? We have, OK, we have 30-something people on this workshop. And let's try to make 30-something jokes, OK? And it's OK if you all make the same joke, because actually, no. Try to think of a unique and original joke, OK? And I'm going to show you guys how to add a joke to this. And what's going to be fantastic is once one of us makes a joke, like everybody else will be able to get that joke. It's going to be awesome. But before we do that, um, let's try to just get a specific joke first. So when y'all went to slash joke, it, it got a random one back, right? You'll notice that each of the jokes has an ID field that basically tells you what the ID of that joke is you can get a specific one by going to that specific ID. So if I go to slash joke slash one, it'll get me the first joke. If I go to slash two, it'll get me the second joke. And if I go to a number that doesn't exist, like 230 something, whatever, um, it'll say joke not found, right? So give that a shot, because once you guys create your own jokes, um, we're going to try and call each other's joke numbers. You're right, Angelica. There are only four jokes. Um, actually, there are only three jokes. Um, when I was running through this workshop earlier, I kind of added a fourth one in. So if, if anyone wants to take, get, take a guess as to which joke is mine, um, 
I'll, I'll figure something to give y'all. <laughs> that is not the challenge for this um, workshop, actually. Um, but we'll add that as a bonus challenge. Why not? OK. OK. So let's figure out how to make a joke, OK? We go back to this Postman thing. Let's go look at this documentation, OK? Did joke slash zero zero gave me a joke number two? That is quite interesting. OK, so in order to create a new joke, we are going to use a post request. If you all remember from earlier, a get request um, gets data, a post request lets you send data, right? So we're going to try and create a joke. So there's a tiny snippet over here of like the, the actual, like, what do you call, syntax of the joke we're going to send. So go ahead and copy this little blurb over here, OK? Um, because if you all remember, when you make a post request, you're supposed to send the information for whatever you want to create in the body. The body is like a big parameter that you send it. Um, and here, we're sending that as JSON, right? So let's go back over here. And actually, instead of modifying the get, what we can do is over here, um, on the left side, you'll see a button called new. You can go ahead and click new. You can click new request. I know there's a lot of different options that uh, Postman immediately presents, but go ahead and click on new request. I can talk about the rest at the very end if you all have questions like what they do. Um, give it a name. So we'll say create a joke. You can give it a description, makes a new joke. And then you can basically save it into that basics of API folder. Ta-da, we now have a new request, OK? Now, what we're going to do is let's copy this URL, OK? And we're going to save that URL. So there's like three or four different steps you need to do to make a post request, so follow along with me closely. says that you do not have permission to create request. OK, Rhea, you need to fork the, um, the entire workspace. Remember, when you go directly to that link, um, you're looking at someone else's requests. It's kind of like looking at someone else's code. You're not allowed to like modify someone else's code um, when you look at it. So when you go to that link, the first thing it'll prompt you to do is fork it. Make sure you go ahead and do that first. So go ahead and copy the URL, right? Joke API demo .com slash joke. On the left, change it from a get to a post. OK, that's very important. And the last thing we need to do is now actually send it the joke we want, right? So let's go to the body. In the body, we're going to click on raw. So there's a couple of different ways you can send data to um, to an API, like you don't have to send your data like in the exact same way. You could send it in binary. You could send it as form data. You could use GraphQL. A lot of different ways to like configure Postman to send data. Once you click raw, just paste that snippet. Oh, not this snippet. Paste this snippet over here that was in the documentation. And change it up a little bit. So you know, put your name down there, right? So I'll put mine. For the joke, I'm going to say, uh, there are, how about, how about this one? There are only types of people in the world, those who attend this workshop and others, okay? <laughs> and then the source is me. Now, if I immediately hit send, it's actually not going to work. Let's see what happens. It says the ID, oh, hold up. One more thing you guys need to do is there's this thing called text over here. Um, change that to JSON. That's important. And then when I hit send, it says joke with ID1 already exists, which is true. So there's already a joke with ID1. Um, let's go ahead and use a different ID. So I'm going to use like. 25, 
If y'all know why I picked 25, do let me know. That'll be interesting as well as a challenge. But then once I hit send, it worked. Um, what does the server send me back as a response? It just sends me the exact same thing that I sent it. So it's gonna send me like the ID, the author, the joke and the source. But now it's essentially been saved in that database, which might take a minute or two to process. But now if you go back to get joke, and you try to call joke number 25, it should in theory work. Ta-da. And this should work for everyone as well, as a matter of fact, not just me. So when you guys try to call joke number 25, um, it should work. Once you guys have created your own jokes, can you let me know like the ID for that joke so I can call it up and then we can read out a few jokes for everyone? <clears throat> All right, 997. Let's do that. <clears throat> the B in Benoit B, Mandelbrot stand for Benoit B, Mandelbrot. Okay, mathematic joke. Uh, thank you for indulging my math major side. I appreciate that. <laughs> Let's go to joke number five from Travis. There are two kinds of errors, off by one errors. Oh, this is a good one. I love this one. This is great. Let's go to joke number eight. Programmers don't need English degrees. They already have programmer. You are correct. Let's go to joke number 17. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Took a moment to process for number 17. What is the most told lie? I have read the terms of service. Interesting. I am 100% sure that when all of you created your Postman accounts, that that is the number one lie. <laughs> all right, let's see. Let's read Neha's joke. Uh, Neha's is still processing. There we go. Okay. Jimmy was walking around a construction site and saw an electric fence that said, Warning, do not touch. He touched it and died and heaven God asked, why did you touch the fence, Jimmy? Jimmy said I was a software developer. I don't care about warnings, only errors. This is a good one. This is a really good one. You know, I think half the applications I've ever built when I compile it, like the number of warnings I get in the console is insane. It's like miles and miles long. Ria, sorry. Hey, sorry, can you repeat what to do after creating a request? Um, yeah, sh totally. Let me go through that again. So once you have clicked new, once you have clicked request, um, give your request a name. Um, for the URL, the URL is the exact same as the get joke. So you can just copy that same thing um, from the get one all the way to this post one. Once you've got that done, change this from get to post, right? So get is for getting a request, uh, get is for making a get request when you're getting data. Post is for when you're posting or sending data. Once you've done that, click on the body uh, field over here, select raw, select JSON, and then paste the template that was provided. Um, if you don't see the template, click on the, the folder and then click on the documentation button over here. You'll see that template. And once you've got that done, just hit send and you'll be able to create your own joke. And once you do that, um, do share your joke number. We would love to read it out. All right, I, I see a few more, a few more rolling in. This is fantastic. Let's let's go, let's go through them. <clears throat> I hope this has been the funniest workshop y'all have attended. <laughs> 101. Why did the chicken cross the road? The answer is trivial and is left as an exercise for the reader. All right, I see, I see you copying from the Math Jokes website as well. Good one, good one. Eduardo, this post does not have a body. So <clears throat> you need to click on the body button over here, click on raw, click JSON and paste it in. So this is where you're putting in the body. The body is essentially like this big parameter that you're doing. Um, Rhea, in the request description, you can leave it blank, um, or you can type in just a description that describes what the what the request is doing. There is no raw button on my end. 
That is interesting. You need to click on the body tag first. Um, if you're like on parameters, you won't see it. You need to click on body and then you will see all of these different options appear. All right, all right. Let's go back to another joke. I think we're on joke number 99. I'm a little lost. Can you give me some pointers? Oh my God. Wonderful hex pointers right there. Although if those pointers like translate to something, um, you'll have to tell us, Pratyusha. <laughs> Let's go to 32. That's CS professor skipping 4 p.m. class. 404 teacher not found. Oh my God. This one feels very, very authentic, actually. I don't think I've read this one anywhere before. I love this. It's awesome. 1206. Let's see what we've got. How do we call a pig with three eyes? A pig. OK. That's a good one. I like it. Let's try this super long one from Travis. <clears throat> Here's a good joke. Oh no, my control key is broken. That's actually, you know, that's actually a nightmare. Like if the control key ever breaks, like if you're ever running a program, like you, you really need the control key. It's the way you start, stop things like um, it, it's gone. Travis, is there a way to get a listing of all the jokes? Um, I don't believe there's an endpoint to get all the jokes actually. Um, I have no idea. The person who made this uh, joke application, it's really just a simple CRUD application. If you think about it, like we're calling it a joke application, but it's really just a simple CRUD application. Let's use save data, fetch data, things of that sort. Um, we have our own CRUD app actually that I was tempted to use for this, but there is no endpoint on it to be able to get all the jokes. So if you ever build a joke API, I would say add an endpoint where you can get all the jokes. And for the next workshop we do, 100%, we will use it. What do you call a snobby criminal going downstairs? A condescending con descending. That's a good one. It's a really good one. Perfect. OK. I love the rest of the jokes you all have submitted, and I would love to read all of them. Um, but we do not have the time, unfortunately. Rhea, for where do you put the joke number? So in the body of the request um, over here, when you when you hit raw, like there's four fields, right? Um, you can change this ID number. So I changed it from, I changed it to 25. You can change it to like absolutely anything you would like. And that'll be the ID. Cool, okay. But now let's make this a little bit more challenging. So we have, and you change the joke in the body, which we pasted, right? Correct, yep. Whatever you paste in here is what you are sending to the joke API. That is 100% correct. And once you make, once you send your request, feel free to get that ID again and you can test that it worked. Um, it might take a minute or so to sync with the database on their end. It's not immediate. Perfect, perfect. So now if we go back to their documentation, they talk about making a put request to be able to update things. So we can do that really easily actually because the, the body that it requests is identical. So if I go back to my, my, what do you call, get joke, I'm sorry, post joke here. If I try to send it again, it's not gonna work. It says joke with ID 25 already exists, right? I can't create a new joke with the same ID. However, if I wanna edit it, I can change this from a post to a put and then I can change this source. Let's say instead of me, I can be like, awesome guy running the workshop, right? And then I can send it and it'll work. Um, it's not gonna return anything, it's completely blank. However, now if I get my own joke back, hey, look, the source changed. It has been updated. So you guys can try this out too. Just change the post to a put. That's all you have to do. That is the only thing that you got to do. And you'll be able to update your joke. So if anyone has new jokes, do share. 
pretty fun, right? But yeah, this pretty much concludes the demo part of the workshop. Um, if you want to delete your joke, you can do that too, actually. Um, just change the put to a delete. Put slash 25. And then the joke is gone. But this is very sad. So unless you guys really want to delete your jokes, I'm not going to request, or I'm not going to require that you delete your jokes. Um, <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Does anyone have questions about the stuff we did in the demo? This pretty much concludes the demo part of this workshop. Going once, going twice, going thrice. All right. How do we incorporate the API created by Postman into our own program? That's a great question, actually. So um, let's say that you're building a Java program. And you want to be able to interact with um, this Postman API. You want to be able to make a joke, update a joke, delete jokes, create new jokes, things of that nature. You know, that's a really good question you asked. I, I love the question because it's so useful. Like, how do you take what's going on in Postman and actually apply it to the work you're doing? Wow. Thank you, Saksham. Um, but yeah, so the way you're able to do it is on the right side, there's a code button over here. If you click on this code button, um, what this basically does is it converts your API call basically into the language of your choice. So right now this is set as a curl request. So you could copy this and paste it in the command line and it does the same thing. Um, Reshmi and I need to run it one or two times. It takes a minute to update. But I can change this to whatever language I want. Take a look at this. It's fantastic. It's a code generator, essentially. So if you're writing a Java application, ba-boom, right there. That's the code for working with the Postman API. You just copy and paste it into your application, and you're done. Piece of cake. Are you writing in JavaScript? Done. Copy and paste. Are you writing in Dart because you love Flutter applications? Done. Copy and paste. This is one of Postman's most powerful features. You are able to automatically take API calls that you have written in Postman and convert that to code so you can just paste it into your application and call it a day. Um, and literally every language, every library, like hundreds of options are available over here. Um, you want to use Python, you got Python. Everything and anything you could possibly imagine. So that's a good question. How do you take the work you're doing here and translate it? Um, we use this in ACM development a lot, actually, or at least I've used it a lot when I'm writing my own API. Like you make some sort of complex call. Um, it's right here, actually, like this folder full of API calls that I've worked with for ACM. Um, you make the API call and then you're like, oh my God, do I need to type out all of this in like Node.js? Do I need to type this in Python? No, you don't. Click on the code button, copy that snippet and call it a day. One more question, being able to change other people's jokes is dangerous. Who controls that kind of authorization? Great question. So for this specific API that was created by Postman, um, it's, it's not a good API because it doesn't have that kind of authorization, clearly. Um, we would love if it had that kind of authorization, but if you were to write your own API, you would be able to set your own authorization for it. <clears throat> Actually, let me give you a real quick demo if I can, because we wrote an API that requires authorization here. Um, assuming I have the link. All right, real quick, okay. So let's, so this API that I have over here is identical to the make a joke API. Um, it lets you create things and lets you remove things. Now watch what happens. It's going to take a second to send the request. Oh no, response header too large. Never mind. I guess we're not going to be able to do that demo today. But um, essentially, when you create your own API, you can add authorization to it. Um, you can basically say, hey, if you need to change like your own joke, 
Um, I want you to pass in two more fields. Let's say I want you to pass in like, let's go over here. Let's go to the create a joke. Let's say that you can require it to be passing like a username and password, you know? This is also bad practice, by the way, passing in a username and password as part of the request body. But this is something you could potentially do. So now, if someone wanted to delete joke number 25, they have to know my username and password. Um, does that answer your question as to who controls that kind of authorization? Um, this, is, this is just one way of going about it, actually. The correct way about going about authorization in Postman is not through this body tag. It's not doing this, but it's through the authorization panel over here. If you were to click on that, you can select all the different types of authorization that exists. So you can do API keys, you can do um, JWT tokens, you can do basic auth, which is username and password. You can do OAuth type of requests where you're passing in client ID, client secrets, and it'll automatically handle your callback URL for you. It, it's phenomenal. There's so many different things. Accidentally deleted Saksham's joke. That is sad. <laughs> Saksham, you can make it again. We will read it out loud if you do. <clears throat> Okay, so now that this is done, let me go back to our slide deck. But yes, yeah, see, this is exactly why we need authorization. Um, if any of you ever went to the, what workshop is it? The Hacktoberfest workshop for dev, um, we ensured that people could only modify their own or fetch their own data by requiring like email address as one of the parameters. I don't know if y'all remember that, but it was a very simple way to ensure that you can't just modify or get anyone else's data. Um, but yeah, all right, let me pull up our slide deck again. All righty. Okay, Saksham made his, okay, let's go read Saksham's and then we'll actually go to it, okay? Yeah. I, I really wanna hear what this fantastic joke that Saksham's made is, 1281. What part of programming are you really good at? Writing comments. Oh my God, you guys wouldn't believe the number of comments that Saksham has written. I think it's more than the lines of code he's written it. Um, very, very good at documentation. Like, and I, that's actually one of the most important skills to have when you're trying to be a software developer, writing good documentation. All right, back to our slide deck. So a little bit of a recap. What have we talked about during this workshop? We have talked about Request essentials, you need to have a method in your request. So get, put, post, or delete. Actually, there's more. If you go to Postman, like when you click on this dropdown, just look at the sheer number of different types of request methods you can have. Second thing, you need to have addresses. What is an address? An address is a combination of three things, the URL itself, the path, and any query parameters. Well, that's the third thing on here, parameters. The fourth thing, authorization, which you guys asked some really good questions about in the chat. Um, authorization is super, super, super important. Um, otherwise, people can mess up each other's um, data, right? And finally, body data. Body data is what we sent to be able to create a joke. The body is essentially all the information needed to be able to make that joke. Um, it's like a huge parameter. You can think of it that way. So this is where you get swag, okay? Let me explain. So you need to do two things to be able to win awesome, awesome swag from Postman, okay? Step one, create your own public workspace with a collection using any API of your choice. So you could create your own API or you could work with an API that already exists um, you could choose to work with the ACM API if you choose to be extra fancy and you want to be able to get swag from me as well. Um, that's the first step. The second is, so there is a link over here, which I'm going to drop in the chat as well. Why not? Um, basically it's a form. And if you go to this form, 
and you submit your workspace URL. So like when you when you go to Postman, there's a button called share. Uh, it's somewhere in the top right. Um, you can basically share the requests that you have made and you can share it with Postman. And the Postman representative who will be going through this um, very soon after you guys submit all of them, I think sometime this weekend, um, will be able to decide like whose project is the coolest and they'll be able to get some awesome swag. Um, anyone who actually submits that form will get swag as well. So everyone will get stickers. Everyone will get like a swag pack from Postman if they submit that form. Um, but whoever has the coolest API, whoever has the coolest requests that do the most awesome things, they're going to get a special swag pack. Okay. So I hope that has hyped you up enough. Um, Postman has some incredible swag. You can look at what's on their website. So that's what will be heading your way as well if you win. Um, one more thing that I will rem remind you guys is throughout this entire workshop, you guys have been seeing at the bottom of the slide, like an event check-in link. If you want swag from ACM, if you want ACM stickers, and if you want ACM swag, go ahead and check in because at the end of the semester, we're going to look at who's been attending our events and they will get a lot of swag proportional to the number of events they've attended. So please check in. Um, I'm going to share a link to that in the chat as well to make it easy. Great. A couple more opportunities that are coming your way through Postman. One is student expert certification. So if you guys want to be like Postman student experts, um, they'll give you a certificate. They'll put, give you a badge, which you can put on your um, resume. They'll You can put it on your LinkedIn. You can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, go check it out. Um, it's, it's on their website, how to become a Postman student expert. Um, there's a list of like courses. It's fairly easy to complete actually. So you guys can go ahead and do that. And you'll also have the option once you finish it to become a student leader in your community, which means you will end up doing workshops on Postman to more people. So there's a link to it over here. For what is your classification? Feel free to answer um, by year. How long does it take the student program? That's a good question. It depends on how long you're willing to dedicate to it. Um, if you're familiar with working with APIs already, then it shouldn't take too long. If you're new to it, then maybe it'll take you a little bit longer. Is this UTD student only? No, it's not. This is a global program. Um, anyone across the world can become a postman student expert. You'll get access to like their forums. You'll get access to like a community of like-minded people. Sam asks, am I a Postman student leader? Um, that's a good question, actually. People who run these workshops are called Postman student leaders. Finally, a couple more resources for you guys. Check them out. Um, I particularly like the second one over here, explore.postman.com. If you go to that link, you can explore like all the APIs that exist out there. So imagine you want to work with Facebook's API, right? If you go there, you can see someone else's um, workspace where they have all the requests written to work with like Facebook's API. So if you're building an application to work with um, Facebook, you don't even need to write a single line of code. You can go to that website. You can look at the Facebook workspace. And then kind of like I showed you where you can just copy the code from Postman, you can copy the code to work with Facebook's API and you're done. Without writing a single line of code, your application is now being able to interact with a third-party service. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for sharing the link. Q&A. Who has questions? Because I have answers. When do you recommend to share our project? Before this weekend? That's a good, yeah. Before this weekend is definitely a good time. So take your time. You don't have to do it right away. Um, feel free to submit it at the end. Neha asks, how do API keys work? So API keys are a form of authorization, right? Um, much like username, password, much like client secrets, API keys are a way for you to be able to say, hey, I am authorized to use this API. Now. The main reason API keys are used is so that the company itself knows who is use, knows who is using their API. For example, let's say you want to work with the Facebook API, hypothetically, right? 
if they just let anyone and everyone make API calls, how do they know who is who, right? How do they know that you are this person associated with this account? So when you sign in to Facebook's developer portal, you can get an API key from there and that API key will be unique to you. So when on every single API call, you include that API key, um, Facebook will be able to know that, oh, it's Neha who is making these API calls, right? Sometimes they also do it so that they can track your usage and charge you accordingly. Like some APIs are not free. If you use Twitter's API, for example, they bill you based on how many tweets you're able to fetch. So how do they know how many tweets you're fetching? It's because you're gonna have to include your API key in every single request you make. And so they'll be able to tally it up easily. When will the recording be posted? Um, hopefully sometime this week um, after we're done processing it and being able to upload it to YouTube. Can we have the slides document and the recording? Yeah, sure, why not? Um, when the recording is up, um, if you have checked in to this event, so when you go to that check-in link at the bottom, it'll collect your email address by signing in. Um, if you have checked in, I will send you guys an email that has both the slide deck as well as the recording link in it. Any more questions? And you guys can always engage with me or the rest of our team like on our Discord workspace as well. Um, great place. But yeah, that's about it. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much for coming. You can always email me to ask your questions if you have them at a later date or point in time. And I hope you guys have fun making your workspaces. Yep, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and thank you, Harsha, for hosting this. We definitely had, we had to switch out the speaker last minute and Harsha was um, super helpful and um, chipped in. So definitely a great workshop. I learned more about Postman, although I feel like I, I should have known about Postman before because it's used a lot. Um, it's definitely interesting. Thank you. <laughs> If there are any last questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. But if not, you guys can uh, go ahead and leave. Uh, be sure to check in with the link on the bottom before you do leave. But you can definitely take until the end of the week to fill out the form with the uh, workshop URL that Postman sent out 